So welcome everyone. This afternoon we're going to devote our words to King David, David Amelech, who is the figure, the major, the central figure of Chag Shavuot that we're now coming out of. A few days ago, we uh, celebrated Chag Shavuot, which is the time of the giving of the Torah. And uh, we're taught that there are actually three very great figures that are associated with uh, Shavuot. Obviously, Moshe Rabbeinu that gave us, he's the channel through which God gave us the Torah. And uh, King David, that we're going to speak about today, he was both born, we just heard about a birthday. Both his birthday and his passing were on the holiday of Shavuot. But he lived exactly 70 years from day to day. And the other great uh, figure that is associated with Shavuot is the Baal Shem Tov, because also his passing, he wasn't born on Shavuot, he was born on Chai Elul, but he passed away on Shavuot at the age of 62. So obviously the Baal Shem Tov represents the whole Hasidic uh, movement, which is a uh, actually a messianic movement, bringing the consciousness of the people, the people of Israel, to a state of realization that God is here with us, and that we just have to connect very strongly within our will and faith to God. That already is bringing the Mashiach. King David is the eternal king of Israel. David Melech Yisrael Chavikayam. He lives and continues to exist forever and ever. Moshe Rabbeinu also, it says that Moshe Rabbeinu lo met, just like Jacob, the third patriarch, the choice of the patriarch who said he didn't actually die. The same thing is said about Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu. So these three figures of Shavuot are all very, very eternal and uh, all have to do with the, with the ultimate purpose of creation, which is to bring redemption to the whole world, which is to bring Mashiach to, to the whole world. But once more, the special of these three, the special one that we're going to talk about now is uh, King David, David Melech. The last several months, we've devoted each class to one very great central figure of the, of the Tanakh. The father is Moshe Rabbeinu, today is going to be King David. King David is the archetypal soul of Malchut, of kingdom. So everything about him has to do with, with the kingdom the way that God wants it to be. Because we know that kingdom can go very wrong the very beginning of creation in Kabbalah has to do with the, the, the rule, the reign, and the death of seven primordial kings, the kings of the land of Edom, descendants of Esau that we're going to mention shortly. Once more kingdom, this is now this uh, in modern uh, culture is is thought by most people is a very uh, first of all it's not democratic that's what people think so it's not the way that uh, that the modern world the enlightened modern world should uh, run society but we still do believe in kingdom why? Because we have the hope that we're going to have a really righteous king like King David. It was obviously something altogether different from, from kings as we picture them in our mind after uh, studying history. As we have done in the previous classes, we're going to try to 
to picture all of the different uh, properties and attributes of King David one by one and associate them, with parallel them to the supernal spheroid, which also are reflected in the powers of the soul. Before we begin, we'll just say that the, the one of the other of the three figures associated with Shavuot, the Baal Shem Tov, is also very, very closely related to King David. Because according to the Hasidic uh, tradition, the Baal Shem Tov is actually the soul, the nefesh of King David. So there's a very, very strong affinity between the two. And uh, when we go through the different uh, attributes of, the, of King David, in certain places, we'll, we'll see there also the Baal Shem Tov. The first two kings of the house of David are David and his son Solomon. Solomon is described in the Tanakh, in the Bible, as the wisest of men on earth. That obviously has to do with the sphira of wisdom, but it's the wisdom of Malchut. The whole lineage of David, of the house of David, is the unfolding of the of Malchut, of kingdom. The first two of kings of the house of David, which are David himself, David Amedek, and his son Solomon. David devoted himself, all of the wars that he fought was all to prepare the material, the physical material, the gold and the silver, and all of the physical material for the construction of the temple. But what he had in his mind, his purpose was to build a home, a dwelling place for God on earth. That was his whole life's mission. But because he was a warrior and his hands were full with blood, as it says, even though it was blood of the enemies of Israel, so in a certain sense it was a mitzvah, a great mitzvah, but nonetheless, since he had blood on his hands, God said that you you yourself, even though the the house, the home, that will be built by your son, Solomon, will be called on your name. This is the house of David, the temple in Jerusalem. But nonetheless, you yourself with your hands that have blood on your hands cannot build it yourself. Your son will build it. Meaning that the son, Solomon, is the, is the fulfillment of the deepest desire of the father, King David. So the two go together. How do they go together as far as the Sfirot, in relation to the Sfirot? King David is the crown of Malchut. In Malchut itself, in kingdom, we have the whole array of all of the levels, all of the Sfirot, all of the powers of the soul. The first is the crown. And then his son is wisdom, because after crown comes wisdom. These two, David and Solomon, are just like the first two days of Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year. The ten days of repentance, the first ten days of the, of the year, themselves correspond to the ten Sfirot inter-included within Malchut. It is all in order to construct, to build the true Malchut, the the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of heaven as reflected on earth in the kingdom of David and his house. And the first two days of those ten days are the keter, the crown of the Malchut, and the wisdom of the Malchut, which are actually directly corresponding to David and Solomon. That's why in many prayers also we mention them together. David David and Solomon. But this was to say that the, the first uh, property of David, of King David, is that he is not just Malchut in general, but specifically he is the crown of Malchut. What does that mean in, 
in the consciousness of the people was one more than any other psalm, even more than the patriarchs in a certain way. Kingdom is the source of all of the souls of Israel. And the soul of David is the, we can say, the consciousness, our consciousness, our collective, it speaks in psychology, collective uh, unconscious. But there's also a collective unconscious, the collective consciousness. What we're concerned with is the collective consciousness. And the collective consciousness of all of us sitting here all around the world is actually the soul of David, which is Malchut. What does it mean that, uh, that he is the crown of kingdom? In the Hasidut we're taught that the crown itself has three heads to it. And the simple terminology for the three heads of the crown is faith, and pleasure, and will. To be the crown, faith, and pleasure, and will. Those are the three heads of the crown. So the crown has it, emunah and da'anog and ratzon. Those are the words in Hebrew. As we said before, in our modern uh, society, to think about a king, in fact, you have a state and you have a president or you have a prime minister, that passes, that goes. But to think about a king is something very, very uh, not lo mekubal nowadays, not, uh, not accepted in general consciousness. In order to, to connect to kingdom, the very first thing is that we have to believe that there, that there can, there is in potential, the, that righteous soul who is worthy to be the king of Israel, to be our king, to be my king, to lead me, my commander-in-chief, it's going to give me orders, and I have to obey his orders. I have to believe in the potentiality of that, of the concept of kingdom. That's the faith in kingdom. The kingdom that there can be and there is in potential right now a good king of Israel, just like King David. As soon as I believe in something, let's, let's try to explain this a little bit more. The Baal Shem Tov, we said the Baal Shem Tov is very closely related to, the, to King David. He said that just like a Jew has to believe in God, in the existence of God, and the, God is the creator of the universe, God is the giver of the Torah, exactly in the same way, every Jew has to believe in every other Jew. Just like you believe in God, you have to believe in, in your fellow man, and your fellow Jew. What does it mean to believe? To believe that there's hidden potential, infinite hidden potential that not always do you see. And sometimes you see what appears to be the opposite, meaning negative phenomena in someone else. But you have to believe. First, you have to believe in his goodness, in his spark of divinity. In his divine soul, which is a chedek heloka mimam mamish in the terminology of the first Rebbe of Chabad, the actual part of the divine. In the same way that the Baal Shem Tov says that we have to believe in every Jew, we also have to believe in, in the potential king of Israel, obviously the king of Israel that we're all believing in and want to want him to come and appear and lead us he has another name his name is the Mashiach so the very fact that, that one of the 13 principles of faith of the Rambam is to believe in the imminent coming of the Mashiach to believe in, in his presence that is actually that consciousness that faith is King David's soul at the very highest level in me, in each one of us.
to believe in Mashiach. As soon as a person believes in something, and he begins to, to, to ponder, to contemplate that faith, if it's something very, very good, it's utopia, it's the best possible thing, his soul becomes full of the pleasure to be. With the realization, the fulfillment of that, of that in which he believes. That's the second level of the crown. After he becomes full of pleasure just by the thought, right now we close our eyes or open our eyes and we contemplate the coming of Mashiach. I believe in the coming of Mashiach. So the first thing that I should feel is a surge of, of pleasure. It's nothing better than that. What comes then? What comes afterwards? I want to realize it. I want to make it happen. The Rabbi said, do everything in your power to make it happen. If there's something that depends on me to make it happen. If I really want it to happen, then I'll devote myself to make it happen. Those are the three heads of the crown. And all of those three heads of the crown, first the faith and then the pleasure and then the will, the will is, over, the will is, a, is taking responsibility. So if you want it to happen, once more you, you have to do something in order to make it happen. All of those three levels are the presence of King David in, in each one of us. Last month, when we, when we spoke of, uh, of Yitzchak, of you know, Isaac, the second of the patriarchs, we explained a, a very, very deep and important uh, teaching of the Arizal, the greatest of the Kabbalists, that initially Isaac was a feminine soul in a masculine body. But then at the Akirat, the binding of Isaac, he also received the masculine soul and was able to marry. There's something about King David that's even more so, that he didn't have to undergo a metamorphosis. From beginning to end, King David, even though he's a male, but he is a female figure. There's something essential about King David that he's female. And once more, he doesn't have to change. This is the way he is supposed to be. At the end of the uh, period of uh, of the reign of his son, Solomon. So there was a rebellion that began by the, uh, by the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. His name is Yeravam. And he was a very, very high soul. And just the, he went very, very off, became a, a wicked king. But since he was a very, very great soul, the, the sages say that at a certain point, God took him and said to him, to Yeravam, let's let me and you and King David all walk together in the Garden of Eden. He invited him. God invited this King Yeravam, the first king of the northern kingdom, to 
walked together with King David and, me, and God, me, all three of us in the Garden of Eden. So how did the Yeravam respond to that invitation? His response was, Mi Barosh, who's, who's going to go first? <laughs> who's first? So uh, God said, uh, David Barosh, David is first. So when he heard that, that David is first, he said, no, I'm not accepting the invitation. That was the beginning of his fall. What is the secret behind this, uh, this, this story that is told by the sages? The secret is that Yeravam was a descendant of Ephraim. Ephraim is the son of Joseph. And Joseph is the primary masculine power in Israel. Joseph. But King David is Malchut per se, which as we said is essentially, existentially female. So when Yeravam said to God, who's first? This is the way the Arizal explains it. He was asking who should go first, the man or the woman? He says, we know that men are in charge. Men run the world, not, to, not women. So I have to be first, because I'm a man. David is a woman. And God said, you're, you're right. He said, but he knew he was a... He knew Kabbalah. He knew what he was talking about, you know. And God said, yeah, you're a man and he's a woman, but he's first. This is the origin of women first. He got, so when he heard that, that my, that my wife is going to be higher than me, that was impossible to accept such a verdict of God. That was the beginning of his, this is all as the Abrizal explains. What does that mean? There's a verse that reads, Eshet Chayel Ateret Bala, the woman of Valdor is the crown of her husband. So there's something about the female image or persona that is the crown of the husband. And, and that is what was manifest in the soul of David. And there's another way to understand that David is the crown of Malkut itself. Because he reflects and manifests the the very fact that the that the feminine figure is the crown of the masculine figure, and that's why David goes first. And this all has to be very, very deeply contemplated because when we said that Isaac had a feminine soul in the masculine body, we said that it was, because of that, due to that, it was hard for him to marry. He couldn't marry. That's why he first had to, to receive a new dimension to his soul, which was a male dimension, and then he could marry. But here we see that that's, that's not the problem of King David. He married many wives a little bit too much even, his desire for, for women itself. Nonetheless, he is a feminine soul. One of the greatest, deepest stories about King David, of course, is his love story with a male friend, which is Jonathan, Jonathan the son of Saul. The king that first fell in love with David, it says the king himself, so the previous king. But then when he began to envy David, he began to hate him. All of his love for David turned into hate. And then he pursued him his whole life, he tried to, to kill him. But his son, Jonathan, 
became bound very, very, said his soul to soul. In the terminology of Chazal, it's the epitome of love between souls. Love that is not dependent on anything whatsoever. Pure, unadulterated love is the love between David and Jonathan. In that love story itself, there obviously was no physical relationship. But in that love story, once more, the result says that in any love story, there's a relative male and a relative female. And in that love story between Jonathan and David, Jonathan is the male and David is the female. But about that story itself, it says, Ad David Higdil. That he was, he began below, but, uh, Jonathan was the prince, was the king to be. He began from below, but he ascended higher than Jonathan. Ad David, the very same idea between David and Yeravam. The concept, the idea of Eshet Chayel Ateret Ba'ala, that the woman of valor is the crown of the husband. That the woman ascends higher even than the, than the male figure. So once more, these are all examples of the crown of David. Now we'll continue with the next, uh, the next level in King David. The wisdom, even though we said that his son, Shlomo Amedech Solomon, represents the wisdom of kingdom, but David himself was a, a very, very wise, very, very wise soul. When we open the, the beginning, the introduction to the Mishneh Torah, the code of law of the Rambam of Mamadides, we find there that he enumerates the whole chain of the receiving of the Torah from generation to generation. In every generation there is one soul who is the receiver of the Torah in his generation and passes the Torah over to the next generation. Solomon the wisest of men does not appear there. I would think that Solomon is, is, uh, is wise, so smart. He should be one of the receivers of the Torah. But he doesn't appear there. But his father, King David, does appear there. I mean, there's something very, very special about receiving the Torah that has to do with David. This obviously has to do with the fact that his birth and his yorksite are on the day of the giving of the Torah, which is Chag Shavuot, a few days ago. There's something about David that he receives the Torah in his generation and he passes it over to the next generation. About the Torah in general, it says, mi nafkat. That's the terminology. That the Torah comes out of the divine wisdom, wisdom of God. It's the expression of God's wisdom. So if a soul is, is worthy of receiving the whole Torah, and being the receiver of the Torah in his generation, passing it on to the next generation, so obviously that is the wisdom of that soul. Now in this chain of the receiving of the Torah, there's also very something, something very special about David. And David is the seventh in the line. But the Rambam says, the Maimonides says a very, very uh, beautiful thing when you look in the introduction. He begins that the first is not Moses. We know just uh, yesterday on Shabbat we began reading and studying Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the Father for the second time. And how does it begin? It begins, Moshe ki Torah misinai that Moses received the Torah from Sinai. Meaning that Moses is the first receiver, but he's not the first of the chain. The beginning of the chain is, is coming from Sinai, which is actually God himself. 
So that's the way the Rambam enumerates the generations. He says that number one is God. Hashem Elokei Yisrael. Number two is Moses. The first receiver from God. Number three is Joshua. Number four is Pinchas. Pinchas received from Joshua. Number five is Eli, Eli, the high priest, who received from Pinchas. Number six is Shmuel, Samuel, Shmuel Aramati. And number seven is David, because Shmuel Aramati was the one that anointed King David. And in anointing King David, not only did he give him the inspiration, the Ruach HaKodesh, and to the, uh, the ability to manifest his, his deep potential kingdom, but he also, in anointing him, gave him the Torah, the whole Torah. So that Samuel was a, a very, very special figure. He, was, he weighed equal to Moses and Aaron together. So he was the sixth in the line beginning from God, and David is the seventh. The next one is Achiyah HaShiloni, that received from David, not Solomon. And we know that the Achiyah HaShiloni is the spiritual mentor, both of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and the Baal Shem Tov. Right, so this is one, something very special about, about King David in relation to the Torah. I mean, that his wisdom is the wisdom of the Torah. How, how more does this manifest itself? As soon as Shmuel Hanavi, Samuel, anointed King David... So it says, at that moment, a bad, an evil spirit came over the previous king, Saul, Shaul Amir. And his attendants, uh, Shaul Amir said to him that the only way to alleviate your, your anxiety and your evil spirit is to look for someone who can play the harp very well and that it's wise Yodei Anagen there are two phrases, two idioms one is he knows just not that he's an expert musician but he, he, he knows how to play music that can that can sweeten spiritual anxiety or pain or what's called in the Torah the evil spirit one phrase says Yodea Nagen that he knows how to play and the other phrase says Metiv Nagen that he is goodly he knows how to play good which even more explicitly means that he can sweeten bitterness with his music that he plays so the attendants of King Shaul said, look for such, a, uh, for such a boy or such a person. And the one that was found was uh, this youth, King David, King, King David to be. When, uh, when he was praised by the attendants called the, the Arim of King Shaul, Actually, there's a, 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 a list of six different praises. That there's no other figure in the whole Bible that is praised so, with so many different idioms. As is King David in the very beginning of his appearance on what we call the scene of history. That we have a young boy that is Yodean again. First of all, he knows how to play. In order to sweeten your 
your evil spirit. Second, but that's not enough. Together with the fact that he's your day and again, he knows how to play music. Number two is that he's a keyboard chayel. He's a valiant, courageous warrior. Number three is a ishmael chama. He's a man of war. Two different things, to be courageous and to be knowledgeable in strategy. Number four is that he's a Navon Davar. He's wise with respect to practical matters and issues. He knows how he's wise in understanding how to to organize. It's called Navon Davar is the expression in Hebrew. Number six is his Ishtor. He's handsome. He's beautiful. And number six, that was number five. Number six is Yud, is Vashem Imo. God is with him. So we went through all of these six in order to reach this last one. It all begins, the beginning is that he knows how to play music. And the end is that God is with him. So all of the phrases, we understand more or less what they mean, but the last phrase is not clear exactly what it means. What does it mean that God is with him? So one of the simple explanations, God is with him, that whatever he does, he's successful, which is similar to what it says about Joseph, that he was Ish Matzliach, a successful person. It means that he has mazel, he has good fortune. That whatever he takes to hand, it works. He has success, he sees success. But the sages say that it doesn't just mean that. To say that God is with someone means that he has the insight to the phrase in Hebrews, that when he studies a topic in the Torah, he knows how to reach the ultimate decision of the law. A person can be very wise and understanding and knowledgeable in the whole Torah and know it all, but when it comes to a practical matter of psak halacha, what is the halacha? Because we know that every issue in the Torah, there are many opinions, and the opinions can be very contradictory opinions. To have some an inner sense of knowing how to choose between all of the different opinions and what now, what does God want in this situation? What is the Psaq Halakha, the decision of the law? That requires Ruach HaKodesh. Or a special, special faculty that is a very rare faculty for people to, to possess. And that faculty is called Vashem Imo, that God is with you. For God to be with you, means that God gives you the insight to know what to do now. What the Torah, what God wants you to do right now. So actually of all of those six praises that, the, that, the, that they praised David, it says that King Shaul, when he heard the praises, he immediately thought of his own son, the prince, the heir to his throne, which is Jonathan, Jonathan. And he said that my son also has that property. And so did he go through all the properties and he, till he, he reached the last property, which is Hashem Imo, that God is with him. And then he was just taken aback because he realized that my son doesn't have that property. And it says by tradition that in order to have that uh, faculty or that sense of God being with you, to, to know what is the will of God with the halakha, in a, every single situation, either you have to be a descendant of the, of, of the tribe of Levi, or you have to be a descendant of the tribe of Yisachar, which were the Torah scholars, or you have to be a potential king. 
That's the tradition. Once more, to have the, this inner ability of God being with you. You're either from the Levites or you're from the Sanhedrin, the tribe of the Sanhedrin, which primarily the tribe of Yisachar, or you're a king. So uh, when, when uh, Shaul heard that, he understood that this uh, boy is not just uh, knows how to play music, but uh, he's, he's a threat. He's a threat to me because he uh, he's a potential king. And he's more so even than my own son, the heir to the, to the throne. All right, so this was all to say another property that we see that David has a wisdom that perhaps even his son Solomon doesn't have this level of Hashemimah. That's why David was the one that received the Torah from Shmuel and gave it over to Achiyah Shiloni. Once more, David is in between Samuel and the first of the prophets, Achiyah, is the, is the mentor of Eliyahu, of Elijah, who is then the mentor of Elisha. The three greatest of the, of the prophet, the first prophets, it all begins from Achiyah. And it says, even the Rambam says that Achiyah lived a very, very long life span. He was present as a boy, as a young boy. He was present at the giving of the Torah hundreds of years before. But he received the Torah only much later from King David. He was the prophet that gave the northern kingdom by the word of God, gave the northern kingdom to Yerabam, who we mentioned before. In any event, what we now said is that as far as wisdom is concerned, there are two very, very important ideas about King David that identifies him with wisdom. One is that he is the seventh from God to receive the Torah. And second is this phrase, Hashem Imo, that God is with him, that halakha, in Hebrew it reads, halakha kemoto bechol makom. That his opinion is always the, exactly the right opinion in accordance with the halakha, which is the will of God in this particular situation. Even though there may be many, many different opinions, contradictory opinions. Now we go on to the next of the uh, of the levels of King David, which is uh, his state of understanding. So actually, in that list of of attributes that he was praised by, one is Navon, Navon Davar, that he's understanding in relation to practical issues. So already we have a a phrase understanding, but the uh, Maybe the more all-inclusive understanding of King David, mother, mother, understanding is the mother principle, is the very fact that he is called Naim Zmirot Yisrael, the pleasant singer of Israel. Not only is he a musician that knows how to play the harp, but he's a poet. He is the psalmist. To sing in Hebrew is not just to sing uh, vocal music, but it's to sing words, to sing psalms. All of the prayers of the Levites in the temple are the songs, the psalms of David, the songs of David. And the service of singing, of the Levites singing in the temple, the, the divine power that is identified with that service is the mother principle. The mother principle is called noam, pleasantness, throughout the Torah, throughout the Bible. And that's the, 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 the word that is used to describe his singing in general. 
Naim Zmirot Yisrael, the pleasant singer of Israel. He himself says that I ask from God in, in Psalms. Psalm 27, we read it from the month of Elul to Hoshana Rabbah to the end of the High Holidays. It says there that I only ask one thing of, of, of God. To dwell in the house of God. And this is the verse also, as we said before, that all of the desire of his life was to build a house for God and that he himself should merit to dwell in the house of God and to envision the pleasantness of God. Another very important verse that he, at the end of, of chapter 90 in Psalms, is that the pleasantness of God should always be on us. It's one more. That pleasantness is the mother principle in Kabbalah. So once more, we have our two principles. Father and mother go together, called two companions that never separate. A, the receiver of the Torah and the one who halakha kemotobu that the halakha is always as he says, and at the same time, the sweet singer and the pleasant singer of Israel. But these two go together. It's like a person that learns uh, Torah and says Tehillim and prays. When we, we're going to reach Malchut, that's the prayer per se, the outpouring of the soul. But here it's the, it's the pleasant singing which is the higher Hey of Hashem's name, the higher female figure in, in Kabbalah. So once we have Torah on the right, the father principle, and the singing of psalms on the left. The wisdom and understanding of the right and the left brains, brain powers, respectively. There's another very amazing thing about the Bina that has to do with King David. The Arizal says that King David is the major reincarnation of Adam. And that actually he is the intermediate soul between Adam and the Mashiach. Because the Mashiach, Messiah, is the Messiah, the son of David that we mentioned before. And King David is the beginning of the rectification of the primordial sin of Adam and the ultimate final rectification is the Messiah. And the Arizal says that a very, very simple acronym that Adam, David, Mashiach, Adam, David, Messiah spell, the initial letter spell Adam. It's all included within the soul of Adam. Adam, David, Mashiach. What does this teaching say to us? It says that the essence of David is to serve as an intermediate stage between the beginning of history and the end of history. He's the middle. The concept in Kabbalah is called Rosh Toch Sof, head, middle, end. Beginning, middle, end. The beginning is Adam, the end is Mashiach Messiah, and the middle is David. The very fact that he is a middle, that identifies him with Bina, because the Sfira of Bina understanding is called the middle mind. That's why the, the, the root in Hebrew of Bina of understanding is middle, Bain. The way the, the Ibn Ezra explains the Pshat of Bina, that is the middle mind. So it means that the consciousness of Bina is, is the consciousness being in the middle. So once more, King David is the middle point of history. And all of history, the whole book of Kings in the Bible, and the whole book of Chronicles, even more so in the Bible, 
These are the books, these are the history books in the Bible. What is history all about? History is all about kings. That's what defines history. King after king. Monarchy after monarchy. Government after government. That's history. So once more, King David is the middle of history. To be the middle point of history is to be a soul of this Fira of Bina. When was King David born? What year? That Adam was born at the beginning of creation. Year zero. Or one. We'll call it zero for our purposes. Right now. King David was born, I mean, this is very easy to calculate. He was born in the year 2854. It's all explicit in the Bible. 2854. That's the birth year of King David. So if he is the middle point of history between Adam and Messiah, so it's a very simple calculation for Messiah. Because you just have to add another 2,864 years, 54 years. What year does that reach? Huh? 570, what's 5708? Tafshin Chet. Nobody knows. <laughs> Everybody forgot what happened in 1948. Tafshin Chet. Nigoya Shekandler is 1948. What's more, if you put King David's birth at the middle point of history, then the end is 1948. But that's just the birth of the Messiah. At what, how old was King David when he ruled over all of Israel? King David is a feminine principle. It says that first he had to rectify Rachel. There are two feminine figures, primary feminine figures in the Bible. Rachel and Leah, the two sisters. He came up from below. The whole service of King David is milimata lemata from below up. So first he had to rectify Rachel. He had to identify with Rachel. And Rachel is Hebron. And that's why he had to rule seven years in Hebron in order to rectify Rachel. But then after, he ruled at the age of 30. But after his seven years in Hebron, then he came to Jerusalem. In his seven-year period in Hebron, he did not rule over the whole kingdom of Israel, just over his own tribe, the tribe of Judah. But after those seven years, at the age of 37, he came to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is the secret of Leah, and then he ruled over the whole the whole people of Israel, all of the 12 tribes of Israel. So all of these dates are very important, his birth date. But the most important thing is when is he going to become the king of Israel? So, it, so if we make the very same calculation, the very same calculation we just have to add to his birth date, which is 2-8 five, four, 37 years. And then we come to 2891. And if that's going to be the middle point of history, so what's, when is the one that is born in 1948, when does he become, when is he going to grow up Another very important thing the Arizo says about, about uh, King David, he says that until he reached Jerusalem, he did not yet assume his, 
essential position as the kingdom of the world of Atsilut. The world of Atsilut is a world of emanation. It's a world which is totally divine, no self-consciousness. He had all of those years, even as the seven years in Hebron, he still was in the lower worlds. But to assume his real position as Malchut Atsilut, that is only when he came at the age of 37, to Jerusalem and began to rectify the persona of Alea, the higher, the higher feminine principle that is in him. So once more, if if he reigned over all of Israel and came to his level of Atzilut at the age of uh, 37, which is 2891, so when is that going to happen now? It's going to happen in 5782, which is another five years. Either a midpoint or a half point. Okay, well, I agree, make it earlier. Okay, this was all just an additional, additional uh, point that there's something essential about David that he's the middle, the middle of history. And being the middle has to do in Kabbalah with Bina, which is called the middle mind. Right. The next thing, the next level of King David is his dot. The three mental faculties, intellectual faculties, are wisdom and understanding and knowledge, dot. In relation to Bitzalel, the, the one that constructed the, the tabernacle, that according to Chazal, King David himself is, is a descendant of Bitzalel from his mother's side. So that was also from the tribe of Judah. And he is a descendant of Miriam. And it says that Miriam, the sister of Moses, is a... From her comes out the house of kingdom, the kingdom of David, through Bitzalel. So it says that, that God gave Bitzalel the, the properties of wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And Rashi explains the pshat, the literal meaning of these three most important terms. It says that wisdom is the ability to learn, to learn from one's teacher. Understanding is to understand one thing from another, which means to either to deduction or induction. The power of induction, we'll call it. But the dot... Knowledge, Rashi says, is Ruach HaKodesh, is the Holy Spirit. So it sounds very similar to what we said before, Vahashem Imo, that God is with him. They give him the, the, the insight how to make the proper decision according to the Halakha, to the law of the Torah, on the spot, in every, in every given situation. But there's something very special about this that also continues the fact that, that he is the, psalm, the sweet and pleasant psalmist and singer of Israel. That the Arizal, the terminology of the Arizal is that King David is Rabban Shokol Ba'alei Ruach HaKodesh. He is the first and foremost primary possessor of the Holy Spirit. Just like Moses, once more, on Shavuot, we celebrated the holiday of Moses and King David. Just like Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu's Rabban Shokola Nevi'im, the master of all prophets, so King David is the master of all possessors of the Holy Spirit. What is the difference between prophecy and the Holy Spirit? So this is a very, very deep topic in, in Kabbalah. Prophecy is 
light which descends, or called straight or direct light, which descends from above, below, it's directly hearing the word of God speaking to you, and then being able to convey the word of God that you heard to the to the public. But Ruach HaKodesh is something that sprouts from within. It's once more it's inside. It's something that's coming from your own soul. It's not hearing directly the word of God. It's something that's coming from within, or actually from below up. It's called Or Zev. So once more, the two have to go together. We need both Moses and David. That's why the, the figure of Mashiach, which is the end, the epitome of history, it says that the soul of Moses within the body of David. Or once more, the direct light of Moses within the returning light of David. The fact that David is returning light, that also identifies him with the female principle. Because returning light is female. And returning light reaches a higher source even than the source, the beginning of the direct light of the Oriyash. As we said before, the Eshet Chayel. Atelet Pala, the woman of valor, is the, is the crown of her husband. It's much more the fact that King David is the Rabban Shokoba Alei Ruach HaKodesh. What does it mean, Ruach HaKodesh? The Baal Shem Tov, I'm trying not to relate all of the souls, the three souls of Shavuot together. The Baal Shem Tov said that there are infinite levels of Ruach HaKodesh, of Holy Spirit, just like there are infinite levels of prophecy, the highest of which is Moses. But the very lowest level of Ruach HaKodesh is that the first thought when a person is faced with some uh, problem, some, some decision that he has to make, that the first thought that spontaneously crosses your mind, that's the go on it. That's the truth. That's inspiration from within coming from God. Once more, it's not hearing the word of God. It's just becoming inspired. That's the lowest level, just to to have some sense of what it means, the Holy Spirit. That one's first thought is true. When a person studies Torah, one is not supposed to think that my first thought is true. Just the very opposite. I should criticize my first thought. I think that the first is that the whole process of, of learning in the Talmud and the Gemara, that first thoughts are not true. They have to go through an analysis. You have to analyze the first thought. And then you'll come to a second or third or fourth or fifth thought, which is the ultimate truth. But Ruach HaKodesh begins with the first thought being true. Meaning that you can rely on your first thought. So once more, the, the Rabban, the master of all possessors of Ruach HaKodesh, is King David. And this is one of the reasons, as we said before, that King David is actually the deepest state of consciousness of all of us, of all the Jewish people, because every soul has its Ruach HaKodesh, its Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit of each one of us is the presence of King David within us. The origin of that is in Keter. When we count the tens we wrote, we either count Keter, the crown, and then we don't count that knowledge, or we count knowledge and don't count the crown, because knowledge is the manifestation of the super conscious in the consciousness itself. All right, now we'll try to do uh, shortly, in a different place, we went through the seven lower sefirot of David HaMedech in, uh, in great detail. That's why today we're, we devote ourselves primarily to the higher, to the, to the crown and the, and the wisdom and the understanding and the knowledge. So once more, whoever is really interested, there's a lot of uh, already written information about the seven, the seven lower spherot of King David, which actually correspond to the seven days of the seventh week 
of the counting of the Omer, which precedes, directly precedes Chag Shavuot, the giving of the Torah. Because the last of the seven weeks is the week of David. And the seven days of the seventh, of the seventh week are the seven lower Sfirot, spiritual properties of King David. Nonetheless, we'll say in, in short now what, the, what they are. The first is love. One of the most important, amazing things about King David is that his very name, his son, Solomon, in the greatest of his compositions, he wrote three books in the Bible, but the greatest of which is the Song of Songs. And the lover, or the groom, up until now we've said that King David is a feminine soul. But nonetheless, as we said before, he has no problem with marrying women. He had many wives. He had uh, there were six or seven wives which are explicit with their names in the Bible. And according to Chazan, actually he had 18, which is the maximum amount of wives that a king is allowed to marry according to the Torah. His son, King Solomon, we see that he was not, was not totally connected to the word of the Torah because he, uh, he transgressed this, this uh, prohibition, that the Torah prohibits the king to marry more than 18 wives. Nonetheless, there are six that are explicit in the Torah. The first is the daughter of King, Sha King Saul, Shaul himself, Michal Bat Shaul. The last is Bat Sheva, the mother of Solomon. And the most important one in the middle is Abigail, who is one of the seven prophetesses of the Jewish people. Once more, he is a lover. His name, David, is the same as Dod, which means he is the lover of the Song of Songs. It's more, in the Song of Songs, the lover is called the Dod, Dodi. Dod can either be an uncle in Hebrew or a lover. What is the relation between an uncle and a lover? The Torah says a very, uh, a very interesting, beautiful thing, that the, the, the most choice marriage is an uncle marrying his niece. Why? And the niece means the daughter of his sister, not the daughter of his brother. Because just like every person has, has natural, innate love, which in the Torah is called chesed, for his sister, but he's not allowed to marry his sister. But that love is trans transmitted to his sister's daughter. So the greatest love in the Torah is between an uncle and a niece. An ideal, it's the cl closest relative that the Torah allows to marry. A nephew cannot marry his aunt. That's prohibited. But an uncle can, even now, nowadays, an uncle is permitted to marry his niece. And the Chazal say that that marriage is the, the epitome of marriage. It's the greatest love story. So once more, the word in Hebrew is the same word. The, the lover and the uncle is the same word. And it's the name of King David. So we say there's something very essential about the love in King David. Nonetheless, when we look in the Torah, in the whole Bible, we don't find explicitly even one verse that says that David loved someone or loved something. But we do amazingly find five different people that love him. Mean that he is the most loved soul in the Torah. In the, why do we? Why does everybody like King David? Some people now, if you study uh, biblical criticism, has to show them. So, uh, 
scholars and try or in secular education try to to just point out negative things about David. There's a lot of it, but maybe we'll explain why there's so much apparent negative things in his story, in his life story, besides the fact that his hands were full of blood. Nonetheless, we find that he is the most beloved with all of these, so to speak, problematic things about King David, for some reason, he is the most charismatic, what does it mean to be loved? The most charismatic figure in the whole Bible. Everybody falls in love with him. This also means that he's a feminine figure, because you fall in love with women. If you fall in love with a man, it means that that man also has to be a woman. He's an object of falling in love. Everybody falls in love. We said, who is the first person that falls in love with King David? King Shaul, the one that's going to pursue him and want to kill him. King Shaul says not only did he love him, but he loved him by Yehaveo Mo'od. He loved him very, very much at the beginning when he came to play music for him to alleviate his, his evil spirit. He fell in love with him, with this young boy. Who is the next one? His son. Three. Yonatan. It says he fell in love with David. And his soul clinged and became bound to his soul. Who then fell in love with David? Michal, the daughter. His first wife. Who then fell in love with King David? It says that the whole Jewish people loved David. So this is something that continues throughout history. The whole Jewish people, Judah and Israel, it says, both from the tribe of Judah and all of Israel, everybody loves David. And then even there's a fifth person that loves David. Hiram, the king of Tzor afterwards helped either he or, himself, or his son helped King Solomon build the temple so even the, the non-Jewish world fell in love with King David the epitome of the first once more the first the three major figures of the previous kingdom the king himself his heir to the throne and his daughter all fell in love with David. Then the whole Jewish people fell in love with David. And finally, the non Jewish world fell in love with David. Everybody is falling in love with David. It's much more, even though it doesn't say even once that he fell in love with someone, but it's clear that that is, as a face is reflected in the water. So it was the heart of man to man. But if he inspires love, he must be a very, very loving soul himself. And the fact that he inspires love, it means he attracts love. In a certain way, he's the, he, he is the, the epitome of, of love because all of the love in the world he attracts to himself. And then he reflects it back in reflected light, as we said before. Right, so this, this is a very, very deep thing about love in David. And it has to do with his very name, Dod. His Gvurah's might is representing the story of, of, of his, his first, his first uh, courageous act in life, which was killing Goliath, Goliath, David and Goliath. I think that just maybe last year, as was mentioned in the beginning, we even had a class about David and Goliath. That's his kibura. His tiferet, the next fira, is compassion. There are three great figures, which all are the middle line of the Sfirot, which were the great shepherd souls of Israel. That God cho cho chose them 
to lead the Jewish people because they were faithful shepherds. To be a faithful shepherd is the property of compassion, of rachamim, of mercy. It says about the Mashiach, it says, Ki yina'agem, that the leader, from the beginning we, speak, we spoke about a righteous leader, the leader of Israel that we're aspiring for is the most compassionate soul on, over all of his flock. We're all his flock and he is compassionate. Who are those three? Moses and Jacob and David. They all were shepherds and the Chazal say stories, actual stories about each one of the three and how they had great compassion on their sheep. So once more, this is the compassion of King David. The, term, the next few rounds the, is first of all the vic victory of King David, that he was victorious over, over his enemies, and also the eternity of King David. Netzach, the next few is called Netzach, which means both victory and eternity. That's the phrase that we all say, David, Melech, Yisrael, Chayver, Kayam. His self-confidence was active self-confidence, to go after his enemies and to defeat them. The next is his splendor. A true king, it says, his crown fits his head. You just don't go into a, a crown store, like there's a hat store, and, and pick a crown. It says that for the crown to fit your head, it's, it's almost a miracle. It says, if the crown fits your head, that's a sign that you're the king. And that fact that the crown fits that, that's called the splendor of the next sphere of kingdom. The Yisod, the foundation of King David, is the story of King David and Bathsheba. It was a blemish in the sphere of Yisod. And his tshuva that he did, his repentance was a rectification of Yisod rectification of the of the breed of his uh, sexuality and and it says that he gave the power to all of us to the whole Jewish people to do tshuva for sexual issues that's the assault of King David and finally the last is his kingdom he's obviously the king the, the ultimate king but together with kingdom, he, he manifests the inner property of him, which was loneliness, shiflut. He is also the prayer, just like he is the singer. We said he's the singer of the Psalms in Mina, but he prays, he, he pours out his soul to God in prayer. That's, that's a makut property. He's also compared to the moon, that he has nothing, no light of his own. The let, his name has two dalits in it. The letter Dalit stands for the let lay me can make He has nothing of his own. And this he recognized all the time that I possess nothing of my own. Everything is given from, from God. That's his, that's his uh, moon principle. Once more, when we, when we make the blessing over the moon once a month, that's the time that we say, David Medoch is Chavakayam. That's his malchut. Now we'll just end with the one, with one the, uh, thought that we said before. Why is he so problematic when you read the pshat, the, the little reading of the, of the Bible? Not just in the story of Bacha, many, many different uh, stories. Once more, he's the most charismatic person in the world. Everybody falls in love with him. We, we hope and we're waiting for him to reappear. And, but he's full of uh, problems. So the Ariza also devotes a, a lengthy, deep understanding of, of, of that phenomenon. And it is that his soul is, a, is the greatest part of the soul of Adam that fell to the depth of impurity with the primordial sin. And his soul is encaptured, imprisoned for all of those generations for 2,854 years in the depth of evil because of the primordial sin of Adam. And it 
it was redeemed or emitted from that depth of evil for the first time every soul goes through so and so incarnations but the first time that this soul, this great soul was released from the depth of impurity was, was David's birth and because of that since he was so stained so to speak with the impurity that he was coming from that is the reason for all of the things that happened to him. And even though he has sinned several times, God forgave, forgave him because God sees to the heart, as it says about King David. And he sees that his heart was good and the fact that he had, he had Yetzir Horo, he had different evil inclinations, was because of where he's coming from. This is a very important, deep teaching of the Arizal. That there are certain souls that are born for the first time out of a very, very bad, great souls. But they're coming from a very, very bad place. And you can't expect them to be perfect tzaddikim, at least in outer external appearance, in that lifetime. Every time that he reappears, he becomes better. When he comes back as the Baal Shem Tov, he already doesn't have those sins. But what, is the, what does he still have when he comes back as the Baal Shem Tov? He still has the fear of falling into the depth of the abyss, of the existential abyss. As the Baal Shem Tov said about himself, he said there's one person on earth that hears Torah every day, not from an angel, not from a fiery angel, but from God from God himself that God speaks with and teaches him Torah every day and every second of his life he's in continuous fear lest he fall into the abyss how can he fall into the abyss if he has one thought of arrogance in the very fact that he is hearing Torah from, from God himself from no intermediate whatsoever that is the reflection in the Baal Shem Tov of his being King David. So once more, every King David soul has some sense of fall. It says that a fall is like a miscarriage. In Hebrew, a miscarriage is a fall. King David was supposed to have been a miscarriage. Just that Adam gave him 70 years. The patriarch saved him 70 years. But otherwise, he still feels himself falling. But that person that feels himself always falling, he is going to get up. When I fall, I will rise up. And he will be the Mashiach. So let's hope that he comes very, very speedily in our days. And uh, this will conclude. Uh, so today we can, we don't have time to take answer the questions. Whoever wants a question can, uh, can write the question. Thank you, Rabbi Ginsburg. Again, for an amazing, amazing shiur. Everyone mark your calendars. The first Sunday of July is July 2nd. Here, same place. And Putzlar is the same... Uh, same matrix, we'll be here. Um, <clears throat> about the questions, again, if you go to the homepage of this shewer and the bottom right, if you click on it, you'll get a window that you can submit your question to the Rav. Um, I, was just <clears throat> I was just told that the special book of the month is Mystery of Marriage. I'm told that there's no copies here, <clears throat> but it is available for the amazing price of $12, which is basically a th third of the cost. It's a huge book. It's a phenomenal book, The Mystery of Marriage. And uh, I was told that for those who are watching on YouTube, on the upper right hand um, there's a button to click. What? 
there's an exclamation mark in the upper right hand corner. If you click on that, it will take you right to the ability to buy this book online for $12. <clears throat> I just want to add a, a Torah from the Rav because every month we try to offer a book that has something to do with either the month or the shiur. And so we just heard a lot about that David and Melech married 18 wives. But I remember hearing from the Rav that he said that there's a deep connection between the 18 wives that David married and the 18 battles that he was victorious in. That it was on the merit of his wives that he was able to be victorious in these 18 battles. And then, Malchut, when David said, the Anit Tefillah, I am prayer. So we know that the most essential prayer is the Shemona Esrei. So there's a connection also because we're told in the Zohar that the... See what Shemona Esrei means. means what? 18. means 18 Shemona Esrei. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I'll explain 18 also. The 18 blessings of the Amida. So here we have the 18 wives and the 18 battles and the 18 blessings of Shemona Esrei. And the Zohar tells us that the, the time of prayer is a time of battle. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's existential battling with our inner self in order to stand before the master of the world and pour out our hearts. So we should all have the merit to be victorious in all of our battles. Hashem should hear our prayers. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, Everyone help us spread the word about the shiur. Let's get from thousands to tens of thousands. And if you don't have Mystery of Marriage, you should. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal book and for a phenomenal price of $12. So take advantage. Erev Tov.